Hi, this is Ivy Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm also the host of Moms Don't Have Time to Lose Weight, and I'm the editor of the anthology, which you should run out and buy, called Moms Don't Have Time to, a quarantine anthology. All proceeds of that book go to COVID-19 vaccine research. And I'm the editor-in-chief of Moms Don't Have Time to Write, a new publication on Medium, and we're accepting submissions, so please send your personal essays there. And if all that isn't enough, you can follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens, and my website is zibbyowens.com. Okay, now back to this amazing podcast. Amanda Fairbanks is the author of The Lost Boys of Montauk, a true story of the windblown, four men who vanished at sea, and the survivors they left behind. Amanda and I actually did this podcast in person, one of my first (laughs) in-person podcasts since the pandemic. So we were very giddy to be talking to a real-life human being for this podcast. Amanda is a journalist and author who has worked in the editorial department of the New York Times as a higher education reporter at HuffPost and as a staff writer at the East Hampton Star. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, Newsweek, the Atlantic, and the San Francisco Chronicle, among other publications. A graduate of Smith College and a former Teach for America Corps member, she has two master's degrees from Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. In May of 2021, Gallery is publishing this book. In fact, it came out two days ago. The California native lives in Sag Harbor, New York, with her husband and two children. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you. Thank so you so much. much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. For having in me person there. for the first time in a year and six months to talk about The Lost Boys of Montauk. It is such a pleasure to be here, and I'm such a fan of yours, so thank you. Oh, I literally like devoured this book. And I, as I was just saying to you, I wanted to like drive out and go see the memorial. And I went all over the internet looking for pictures. And like this story alone and the way you told the story was just like so immersive and captivating. So Tell everybody how you found the story, your connection at the star, of course. how it all evolved, and how this whole book became what it is. Absolutely. So I was, uh, I'm was i a longtime newspaper and magazine writer, and I've worked at the New York Times, I've worked at the Huffington Post, and we were living out here. We tried living here for a year, sort of as an experiment year-round to see if we could handle it. I had a new baby at the time, and I showed up at the Star offices late one summer afternoon, and David Rattray hired me as a staff writer, and one year turned to three and a half years at the Star. So I wrote feature stories and investigative stories and profiles, and I had never before worked at a small town newspaper before. I was sort of used to the anonymity of working for a large news organization and never having to run into sources the next day after (laughs) a school board meeting while I was getting my coffee, that type of thing. So this would have been the winter of 2016. A man by the name of Biddle Duke, who's now a close friend of mine, was newly hired as an editor. They had launched a magazine called East, and he was getting ready to sort of come up with what that was going to look like. And we were brainstorming different story ideas when he started telling me the great untold story of the so-called Hamptons. The star uses the Hamptons in quotes. Um, I saw that. (laughs) Which is kind of interesting. You have like a ban on it at the paper. It's it. Pretty much. You have to call it like the East End or something. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. South Fork, East End. South Fork, East End. Right, exactly. So Biddle starts going on and on about, you know, this fishing boat that went down off the coast of Montauk in 1984 and these four young men who lost their lives. And during the same conversation, he started talking to me a lot about Mary Stedman, who was the widow of the young captain and who's now in her her early 60s. So he's going on and on and on, and, and it's clear that this is not just any story that he's telling me about. There's a very personal sort of tone to it, and, you know, he sort of sits up taller and his eyes widen, and it was just unlike anything I had heard him speak of prior to that. And I said, well, why don't you want to write it? You know, obviously this seems like Mm -hmm. he was a summer kid and he had been here all of his life. And like, this seems like a natural fit for for you to do. And he's like, well, you know, this is a very personal story. And, you know, my wife is very close with one of the men actually that lost their lives on the boat. And it would just create too much friction. And it really needs an outsider to come in and sort of do it justice. So after that conversation, I was very intrigued, and he put me in touch with Mary, and that summer, things sort of weren't aligning. And we, I actually moved to California with my family for two years that following fall, and Mary and I kept in kind of loose contact. And when I was back the following summer on a vacation, we had met 
for our first interview, she actually kept canceling and I thought I would get on the plane and not have the interview. And, you know, I soon discovered sitting in the East Hampton Library for the first time, just this captivating, rich, complex, just fascinating woman. And little did I know at the time, I would spend the next few years of my life trying to understand her many different layers. And, you know, honestly, at that point, I still thought of it as a magazine story. You know, Mary and I, I flew back to the West Coast. We continued talking. She has a photographic memory. So I soon, like, we would never not speak for two to four hour chunks at a time. We could spend a whole day on, you know, March 27th, 1984, with just this intense, amazing amount of detail. And then as, we, as she started passing me along to, you know, five sources and five more sources after that, as tens of thousands of interview notes started to accumulate, I realized that it wasn't just a newspaper story or magazine story, but really the beginnings of a book. So toward the end of that year is when I wrote a book proposal, and then we sold it that, that January of 2018. Wow. But you yeah. hadn't written it then? I had not written it. So no. So for, for most nonfiction, you have to write a proposal, which is a chapter and an outline. You probably know all this. I, I do, but it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> but most people don't. No, no so it's, good to say, it's good to say. If just, you're a writer of fiction. Sometimes you might have. It's always good to, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. So if you're a writer of fiction, obviously you submit the whole manuscript. If you're selling nonfiction, you sell a proposal. And actually, at that, I actually I went back pretty recently and read the proposal, and that was just based on you know three months of reporting. And then I went to do a whole another years year and a half's worth of reporting oh before I started writing. So that was like you know a very minor layer of what the story would become. The, the book that, that I that was like one piece of the book. There were like. 18,000 facts. And I was sitting there being like, how did she even organize these or keep them all straight? Or like, because you, and you talk about in the book, like the interviewing itself. Like I called this guy and he didn't answer the first two times. And, you know, this is where I got this. And I was just, I mean, the amount, the volume of information is astounding. So like just even to organize it seems like a huge feat. Yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> That is that is a keen observation. No, I mean it, it. It practically broke my brain because I I hadn't written a book before, and you know even though I had written tons and tons of magazine profiles and what have you, I basically went and just gathered enough material I think for three or four books on this topic. To be totally honest, mm-hmm. and the next book I do, I won't research and report you know till the ends of the earth. I hope, dear God, I've learned my lesson. But yes, I, it was it was tricky to organize all of that information because I it would it just went off in so many directions. It wasn't just these men. It was the history of the area. It was the tilefish they were catching. It was grief and trauma and loss. And, like, I had to kind of, you know, journalists, as you know, become sort of mini experts on whatever they're working on. And so it, I had to learn all of those things. Wow. And but, yet it, you did it. I mean, because— was, yeah. Thank you. No, but. it's true. Like, I literally, like, could not put this book down. I was, like, wandering around holding it. Like, you know, that's a good sign. Oh. Like, no, really, it's so good. One of the things I really loved was the impact of the losses, like, not just emotionally, but even physically that it had mm. on all the people. And obviously for, like, generations down the line. But even mm-hmm. something like Mary's hair turning white yes. immediately and, like, how she dyes it blonde now or whatever. And, like, how, who was it whose handwriting changed and, like, his handwriting never went back to normal. Yes. And, like, all these things where you see it's not just your mind. It's literally, like, everything, like, before and after. So just tell me a little more about, like, these long-term changes in every way. So that was what was so fascinating to me. So unlike, you know, a lot of people will, will say, oh, this is a perfect storm book. But, but the drama in my book, I mean, obviously, the, the loss of these four men is, is the major tragedy that occurred. But... Most of the time we spend in this book on land with the survivors and how it was that this thing that happened all those decades ago changed their lives forever, right? So one of the fathers of the young crew members, his handwriting changed, his secretary noticed it, and it shared it with his his second wife. You know, the young widows, you know, who was 29 years old when her husband died at sea with three young kids, her hair turned like a bright white. All of these, all of these ways in which I think grief and trauma and loss sort of change us fundamentally in large ways and small ways and ways sometimes we can't even really decipher and know at the time. That became a, a hugely fascinating piece of this reporting journey. Yeah. And even how some people just never recovered, like Kim, who had just been proposed to, perhaps, we think, right before she, her fiancé slash boyfriend passed away on the boat, right? She just never got over it. And you show, like, what happened to her and how she's, like, working at a laundromat now and got so into opiates and all this stuff. And, like, some people recover or 
seem to, you know, be able to pick up the threads of like a normal life. And Mm -hmm. then other people, it breaks them Mm -hmm. forever. Mm -hmm. And like, who knows which way you're going to go. Absolutely. I think that that was the, the, the piece for me was that this, for, for the residents that live here, was sort of like their 9-11, right? They mm-hmm. knew where they were standing or yep. where they were working when they first heard the news that this boat had gone down. Because back in the early 80s, this was a really small town where everyone knew one another. But you're right. I mean, you don't, you don't know after that trauma which side you're going to come out on. And, and I, I think actually, you know, for this year and a half, two years that I spent reporting and interviewing, and literally it was just one conversation after another about really intense grief and loss and how each of these people sort of put themselves back together, some more successfully than others. But it really wasn't until, like, honestly, I didn't know how to end the book. I don't want to have any spoilers, but it wasn't until oh I God, went the until the... of the book was so <laughs> good. Oh, my God. I was like, <gasps> anyway... It wasn't until the the captain's eldest son really sort of let me in on his healing journey and how it was that he has has pieced himself and continue I'm not saying the work is done and he's like totally yeah, okay yeah, and, yeah. and no one's okay after after losing your father at sea and not having that type of closure you know the human mind needs a body and a a, a period at the end of a sentence and and when you don't have that it creates this sort of insidious effect that some people dealt with, you know, better than others. I just, I have a tremendous amount of empathy for everyone involved in this book. And was it, is her name Jill, the mother of one of the, who was never convinced that her son was dead? She went to her, yes, she died believing. She just like could never believe it. Right, right. She scoured the ends of the earth. Yep. Flying, you know, Putting missing posters. Putting missing posters and believing that, you know, the boat had been shipwrecked and they sort of went on and maybe her son was in South America and... You know, she just couldn't wrap her mind around it. And, you know, as a mother, that just, uh, uh, you know, that broke me. Like, how that feeling of just, uh, of not knowing what happened to your child. Yeah. And then there was the whole, like, fishermen and Montauk community that, like, rallied behind Mary and rallied to, like, even the search and rescue that you talk about and, like, not giving up and raising funds to, like, keep going even when the Coast Guard gave up and, like... The yes. commitment and loyalty, you know, and the fact that so many of the same community felt like maybe the boat wasn't really up to snuff, but what were they going to do because, like, Mike had already bought the boat and, you know, now what are you supposed to do? So that also goes to, like, how much are you supposed to get involved in your friend's business, you know, like, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, like, so much of, of, like, what happens to a community. I don't know. Just, Yeah. Yeah, no, the Mon- I mean, the what I have to say, I mean, there was not one fisherman with whom I either met in person or I picked up the phone and called who was not just incredibly gracious and wonderful and knowledgeable and, you know, didn't talk down to me, even though initially I had no idea what long lining for tilefish meant. Just really incredible people. I mean, people who become fishermen are not doing it for the paycheck. I mean, they make a decent living, of course, but they're doing it because it's their passion and they love it. And it just... Yeah, it came across time and time again that this was a real community of, of, of men, largely, that, you know, would scour the ends of the earth to find their tribe. And it, it also is like, you know, some families, like my husband's family, like they, they come from a family of everybody cooks, right? Some right. people own restaurants, some people do this, like yes. everybody cooks. Like it's in their... Oh, I love that. Blood. I, oh my gosh. <laughs> this is why I'm like, my pants are all different size now. Thank you very much. But yes, it's amazing as a, per, as a wife to have a, as a perk. But like that's sort of in their family DNA. And in here, like some of them had like seafaring men as part of their DNA, right? Like they come from like a line of fishermen they like that it seemed like so part of who they were is like be on the water either like surfing or fishing or whatever I don't know it's like the most elemental things right like water water food food, right it's like right and yet not everybody falls into one of those categories so no and in some ways they they all reminded me of kind of like the classic, you know, American male that's like, mm-hmm. you know, attached to the natural world and, you yeah. know, idealistic and searching for their identity in, in a real way, in a way that requires, you know, brute strength and, 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 t- and real intelligence and paying attention to, you know, shifts and migratory patterns and all sorts of things that I'll never understand, <laughs> to be quite honest. Yeah. But I think that was really very much at the heart of why they all found themselves on that boat, mm-hmm. you know, was, was they were all really looking for something. And the relationships with their dads, of course, which oh, you went so into. Oh, so fascinating. 
And, and a lot, you know, a lot of this book for me, even though it's, of course, a story of four men who lost their lives, but it's really also a story of these women that they left behind. And, and I really could, I still can't help thinking, you know, now that I live, call, live in Sag Harbor, which is a former whaling village, you know, for, for hundreds of years, these men would go off to sea and obviously they weren't text messaging or, or sending notes home. And, and some of them just never came home and there would be years between their absences and these women were running households and children. And, you know, so it's, it's a long line of women that have, have lost their men, you know, if you think over the past few hundreds of years that go through this. So it was just so interesting to, to think of this oh sort of more modern day version of that. Even, like, all the signs that you wrote about, like, all of the signs that, like, Mary got when, like, and all these people who dreamed about something related to this before the big, Mm -hmm. like, shipwreck happened. And, like, I don't know, it's just, like, all this, like, premonition. And I feel like many times people must have commented to you, but well, I mean, I know they did because you wrote the... (laughs) <laughs> they did how like there was this witchy element to Mary, who was oh, really yes. like the central. I feel like she's just, like one of the central characters in in the story. Really, like, what do you think about that? Do you think she was like there was a witchiness? Like, what, did you get that vibe when you met with her? You know, I do, and I think people use witchy sometimes as sort of a put down, and I mean it with deep reverence. Like there, there is something truly captivating and sort of otherworldly about her. And I think she possesses a very unique intelligence. And I do think looking back on the, you know, yeah. on that six months prior to her husband's passing, that, that the, the signs were there. And, you know, even going back as to, the, you know, the moment that he saw this boat mm-hmm. that he had to have, and she immediately knew that, that that wasn't the right boat, and yet she couldn't dissuade him from that. No, she's so fascinating. I, I think I'll never stop thinking about her and wondering about her as, yeah, a, you, as, a, as a woman. When I you just, were saying yeah. you had like these hour conversations with her, I'm like, oh, I'm like jealous. <laughs> hours long. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, maybe I'm not jealous for all the hours, but like I really wanted to, like after reading this, like I want to sit down with her and be like, oh my gosh, like what, what was that like? And you got to do that. That's, you know? I mean, sometimes I would literally be <laughs> like in my office with the tape recorder on, like lying on the floor by the end because it was so long and intense and not that I wasn't interested it was just like I almost had to like lie down as she was recounting this afternoon from you know almost forty years ago. It would be so neat to release part of that as like mm. podcast, limited podcast. There we go. With her <laughs> audio footage, right? I would listen to that in two seconds. Yeah, yeah. Just like little clips or something. I don't know. I don't know. Think about it. something to do with the footage. <laughs> wow. So the process of oh wait, one more thing. I yes, I of wanted course, to know. Please. There seemed like. There was something going on with Dave that you kept referencing, and I wondered if maybe you figured out at all what it was at the end, or if you got any more information, or what your theory was, because it seemed like towards the end of it, like right before right. this final voyage, he he had gone through a more difficult period. Like, what was that about? So I'll never really know, and no no one that I interviewed knows for sure. But as you know, at the end, toward the end of the book, a bunch of different personal secrets are revealed, mm-hmm. and this is sort of the PG version. There were many more secrets that came out no in the way. reporting, if you can believe oh it, my that gosh. didn't okay. get that are not in the book, and that will never leave my computer. I and also my have a podcast called "Moms Don't Have Time to Have Sex," so <laughs> we could we could migrate this conversation over there if that's what needs to absolutely happen. absolutely count me in for that <laughs> because I do think several of the women in this book were sort of pioneers for their time. Interesting. Um, okay, we could, that that could be a separate podcast. Okay, definitely. Right. Count me in to talk about moms and sex, but yeah, I do. I, yeah, it, it's. I, I think that that toward the end of his life, Dave Connick was wrestling with a lot of different demons, and you know, the fisherman's life is a hard life and a difficult life, and yeah, I think he was he was reconciling this huge disappointment he had over the collapse of his parents' marriage, and then it, you know, it was sort of intimated to me that he may have learned of this kind of core secret mm. involving paternity at the core of this story, and that that kind of sh- had shattered his worldview, really involving the two mm-hmm. people that he knew that were in love and happy and mm-hmm. sort of had the appearances of a, of a wonderful marriage. Although I'll, I'll never really know all of the answers to that, but that was wow. suggested to me by a number of people. I mean, I think that's also what's so haunting about it is like, all the things we don't know. I mean, it seems like by the end they had a pretty good theory of what happened to the boat and basically where it was and maybe even where it exactly is and what caused, you know, they were so close after the end. So I mean, close. so close to, oh, but, but just two weeks ago, this, this young shipwreck hunter calls me up 
And he, you know, is, I don't know, he's in his early 30s or what have you, Swedish guy. You know, I was driving back from the city and we're talking for a really long time about coordinates. And Mm -hmm, like, you know, mm -hmm. he's he's also obsessed with the hull of the wind blown. And he's like, well, I think it could be here. And And then he sends me all of these images and charts and all these things that I don't really understand. And I said, well, you know, he's like, so I want to go out diving with my crew this summer. And I was like, well, I have to be on that boat. Like, <laughs> totally. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going down, to, you know, yeah. to dive. But the the mystery of this story, you know, continues. And, and I think that there would be a lot of closure to find, obviously, pieces of the boat turned up during the search. But but the actual vessel itself, I think, would tr- would provide a tremendous amount of closure. Now I'm seeing this more like Titanic, you know, when, like, <laughs> someone's on the boat and the divers go. And, like, you're actually the it's character. It's like the Amelia Earhart yeah. one as well. Yeah, yeah. I didn't see that. Did I see that? I didn't, I didn't oh, or the that. Titanic. It's the same guy that found Titanic that yeah. is looking for Amelia Earhart's body or remains of the of her plane, which they think went down. Yeah, but truly, I mean, it's it's and it's also just not that far from Montauk Point. Like, it's not like they went down hundreds of miles no, away. It was they like were twelve miles or something, right? The, right. They were like coming right in, <sighs> and it was the most terrific storm, and it was really bad, horrible timing, and just the randomness of life, yeah. right? Like, who knows? <sighs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. So as the mom of two kids yourself, reading this story and so much about your reporting, not just this, but that amazing article you just wrote about in the New York Times about oh, Stephanie Reese and how her husband, ex-husband, had brutally like murdered their kids and how you wrote about that and the water and like I just feel all these like themes and your work and like <laughs> where are we going so it's time to lighten it up as my husband no, would say <laughs> no it's great it's great I'm not sure I want to go swimming with you but you know <laughs> like you know so what's gonna happen invited um, to my polar plunge anytime thank you thank you thank you I'll wear like three life life jackets <laughs> how do you feel about like all of this sort of loss around children and mothers, and it's just like, how does it make you feel about your own role in mm. your family? Well, I just think the mother is sort of the core of the unit, right? Like, it's a lot of pressure to keep it all, all these balls in the air and, and keep it going. It was interesting, when I sold this book, one of the editors with whom we met, my agent and I, you know, we were sort of making small talk, and at the time, my daughter was two, I had a two and a five-year-old, and she's like, well, this is, that's ridiculous because you're never going to have time to report and write this book. And, and she was perfectly nice and being kind of candid about it. And she was probably right. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have undertook such a complicated story. But I have always felt drawn to this story from the moment I heard about it. And I think increasingly I just want to do work that, that I feel connected to in a very personal way that, in, that does involve healing eventually. That mm-hmm. There has to be, there's a lot of darkness but there has to be some sort of sliver of light that, you know, we kind of keep going and and that we're all, you know, I, I do think these stories help us to feel less alone. I do. do you know, like, where that comes from in your own story? Oh, well, I certainly, I, I wouldn't say that I had the most idyllic childhood. I've done a lot of work on myself. And I think I'm just comfortable talking with people about this because I've now been doing it for so long. So, for instance, it was such a natural fit in some ways to have done this book and then to have just randomly met Stephanie and unlike people that aren't so comfortable talking about grief and loss, I'm totally comfortable now talking about it. And she could just tell it, tell me her story without feeling like she needed to sugarcoat things or I was becoming uncomfortable or that type of thing. I think we all just want to be listened to. Well, I'm listening. Do you want to share anything else? <laughs> I mean, I'm not revealing all of my deep dark skeletons on our in our first conversation. I mean, what if it's that'll all be last? on the Moms Who Have Sex podcast? <laughs> then we can get into like some really crazy stuff. Moms who don't have sex, okay. or moms who do have sex. Okay, I, well, I guess we'll find out then. Oh my gosh! Well, so what now? You just finished this massive project. You're yes, perhaps writing the screenplay. We'll see. Who knows? Perhaps we'll see. I would like to try my hand at that, but we'll see. You know, I, I recently had another sort of family story shared with me that has nothing to do with the sea. Okay. <laughs> You'll be happy to know. No. <laughs> it, like, there's literally no water involved in okay. the entire okay. story. Good to know. But it is sort of a, I, I think why I am endlessly fascinated by families and, and you know, histories and how, how complicated all of our lives are, how there are so many layers that 
inevitably we just, that are not revealed or that we can't talk about or we don't talk about or we're shamed into not talking about. And those sorts of stories really intrigue me. Wow. Well, I can't wait to see what you sort of set your tenter hooks into next time to like really dissect, even without the, I feel like I should be using more fishing analogies or something. (laughs) (laughs) What advice do you have to aspiring authors aside perhaps from not choosing such a complicated topic? Although I would disagree with that because then you get a really intricate, you know, layered book and everything. Mm. What advice would I offer? Well, I would I would advise becoming very, very comfortable with the feeling of rejection. I was listening to one of your podcasts earlier today. Oh. And, you know, I think all of us as writers, you sort of see the after effects of like, they've written here and they've have this byline there and they've published a book. And and behind that is, you know, a whole host of agents when I send them my proposal who didn't get back to me or who said this could never be a book. And you have to just keep going until you find your people that believe in you and stand behind you wholeheartedly and help you on that journey. So this book also went through several different drafts, (laughs) as Jackie Cantor will attest. (laughs) Painstaking drafts of how to structure it and in which order this information comes. And, you know, it it was a puzzle and it could still have been put together in different in a different sequence. Mm-hmm. So that was the, the really tricky part of it. Yeah. Yeah, you had your Mary section. It was like at the end. No. Which... Maybe I'll rewrite it for the paperback. No, just oh, kidding. Yeah, look, kid, totally kidding. I will never <laughs> look at this manuscript ever again. <laughs> never say it ever. <laughs> I won't hold you to that. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you. I, I could talk about this book like so much longer, but um, thank you, Zubi. it's really just so fascinating and so sad and just like knowing even as we're sitting here that like all this history is sort of like seeped into the land, if you will, and like all around us. It's just, I don't know. It just is, it's, an, it's a good way to like give you pause on like a Saturday afternoon, right? Yes, But absolutely. now these men are like in my consciousness sort of forever and like part of the landscape. So. I mean, I think about them every time I go in the water, yeah. whether it's in the winter or the summer. Or, and now like March yeah. 28th, right? That's the day? March 29th, yeah. Okay, now. March 29th. <laughs> okay, good. I'm but interestingly, for all of the survivors, you know, March, just March, the whole month is like a thing that is still sort of shows up in these weird ways. And I think all of us have dates like that mm-hmm. where there's been a, a, tra- a traumatic event and it lives with us. And, you know, when you're doing your grocery shopping or running an errand, like we, you know, we don't show those things on the outside. So so true. It's good to kind of give each other the benefit of the doubt. Wow. Thank you so Thank much you. for having me. Thanks for Such coming. Such a pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music.